we're back, sort of. <laughs> kind of. Where have we been? Where haven't we been? Right. You're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> your humble host, John Dayton, here, welcoming you back to the 26th episode of the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast, Hello. joined to my immediate left by my full-time co-host, Anthony Kuzabucky. Hello. You say hi to the ladies? Hi, ladies. <laughs> got nothing. <clears throat> still on. Still on that. When the gas gaslight goes on, that last gallon, I think, is what I'm I'm burning through right now. So what he's saying is, we're pretty tired, folks. Uh, sorry about the blog. Sorry about the podcast sort of falling by the wayside. We actually did receive uh, a couple of concerned emails from fans, so that was <laughs> that was heartwarming to know that there are a couple of people out there. <laughs> other, other than our wives that care if we're alive. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the busy season just hit for a couple of guys that work at churches, and uh, we just... It was actually you, you can't hate Christmas as much as we do, unless you work at a church. There's just there's no Christmas and Easter. I don't are, hate it. It's just the busy season. You don't hate it. I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm saying I. There, yeah, like, I can I, understand. I don't, I don't like Christmas as it is. I can understand you having negative feelings. <clears throat> yeah, but yeah. people keep asking me if I want to go to see Trans Siberian Orchestra, and I'm like, no. I want to so sing. Give you the same answer I've given you for the last decade. <laughs> right. No, I want to <laughs> do that shit for a living. I want to <laughs> sing Silent Night by a single candle and go to bed. <laughs> but uh, no, I, Anthony definitely has more reason to be fed up with Christmas production than I am because they they do. All the things. This, like, the, the last the last two weeks are nothing compared to. I'm taking. I'm going out of town the week of Christmas actually, and nobody knows yet. So we'll, good for you. Good for you. Yeah. The thing for me is just that uh, it's it's been a fair number of days without any real time off. Uh, we had a week of work followed by a full weekend of. Oh, that's right. We could talk about that concert. Of shoot. Yeah, we had a concert in, and which was yeah. We, we should talk about that. That was pretty cool. Had a, a concert on Friday. Some national acts came in, played at my church, and then Saturday, Sunday, Monday, we had three days of shooting, finishing up the Christmas movie project, and then since then, I've been pretty much cutting audio like a madman, editing dialogue, <laughs> filling in foley, uh, just trying to because it's all it's basically in my court now. The guys doing the right. editing are are closing in on having their portion of things done, so it's down to just me getting the sound. So hit a few snags. Of uh, fortunately, the first first few scenes took just ages, and I feel like they're still not completely right. But I went down a lot of wrong wrong avenues there, and had to turn around and, and redo stuff. Um, what was really encouraging was when I sat down to a fresh block of scenes. Stuff was coming together like bang, bang, bang. I was I doing a that. scene a day this week. Oh my gosh! They're, they're, well, not kind of the same same approach to it, but there's some stuff that. For, for my band that I haven't pulled out and worked on and you know you spend 10 15 hours in a couple of days just really banging out mixes and you're like all right it sounds really good and you go back you're like oh I'll totally do that different in five minutes you got a, mm -hmm. a mix sounding 10 times better yeah and it just carries on from well my there. my mixing philosophy includes that like I'll usually when I show up to work on a scene I'll usually finish mixing a scene that I set up. So, like, I'll try and, at the end of a day, do all my dialogue editing, like, just grabbing the stuff out of my session, lining that up with the camera audio, getting everything so the lips sync up. When I get that all settled, I'll go home for the night, come back the next morning, pull up the session, start really mixing in earnest, and then towards the end of the day, start cutting the next scene dialogue-wise, and then, you know, come back to it all a little bit later. Because you yeah. just, you get so you can't see it. I mean, I... Yeah. It's embarrassing, but like I have my boss in, like you know, one I want you to see this just because it's getting close, and two I want you to see see and hear what I'm not hearing, yep. and I just I get so I can't see or hear it anymore. Like there'll be something <laughs> that's obviously off, uh, you know, like just I mean by seconds I've had lyric words off with with lip movements, <laughs> and you know it, it takes somebody else coming in the room to point that out to me. Like uh, yeah, he says what, and then. <laughs> In a few seconds, his lips move. Like, oh, oh, yeah, red face. Um, <laughs> but it's not bad. I mean, it's 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 the kind of thing you get. You know, if you're a, conducting an orchestra and you spend a bunch of time working with the trumpets, you get so you can't hear the piccolos. Right. Um, so I'm, I do the best I can to to be able to sort of trick my brain into approaching things freshly. But it it also definitely pays to have additional pairs of ears and eyes mm -hmm. that you trust coming in to yeah. work on stuff with you. Definitely. 
Let me see. So yeah, the uh, the concert. Yeah, that was cool. We had uh, a bunch of guys I'd never heard of, but I don't listen to Christian music. So some some fairly heavy hitters coming in, some folks that were pretty well established in the game. Uh, and actually, I didn't find this out until they actually got here. But the the tour, the main tour package, was just two of the acts, and the promoters that had picked up the tour for this portion of the country had booked in and added on a third act who was the headliner. Right? The headliner. Yeah. He was he was bigger than the other two. It was because ticket sales in the Northeast are usually junk. Um, so they did that to kind of generate some more interest, but uh, and it was just for two dates. So mm-hmm. when they got to my place, it had been five weeks of uh, it was Aaron Schust and Big Daddy Weave, um, and their guys had it down to a science. And then yeah. we had uh, Jeremy, Jer- Camp. Jeremy Camp and a partial crew of his, and really no gear. Like they were, they were just a joy to work with too. Let me tell you, the, oh, those guys were great far from the worst that we ever worked with but yeah <laughs> that's those, true they were but the compared to uh the other you know the other the other guys crew, was yeah. amazing but uh in their defense you know they were coming in you know taking their established show and cramming it into somebody else's established rig and workflow and they really did pretty well for for what i mm-hmm. could see going on there were some issues with the lighting um which i could foresee anybody running into but you know the guy was Trying to run his show from a laptop on somebody else's rig, yeah, and it was plus patching to your stuff. He was having a time of it, yeah. yeah. It seemed like he kept his cool most of the time. The, the little blonde guy with the long hair, right? Well, oh no, it was the other guy. Oh, that. Oh no, the uh, the guy I'm thinking of. The guy you're thinking of was was on. He was on the main tour. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He. I mean, he was. He had everything together. He yep. was. He was pretty solid about his stuff. Yep. And they all were. I mean, it was. It was neat to see a bunch of guys. I mean, it was. It was clearly a small tour in the grand scheme of things. It was probably one of the bigger Christian music tours going on around. Yep. But uh, just to see the way the guys played multiple roles, worked together really smoothly. Um, we met a dude in the parking lot at nine thirty, ten in the morning, who was in charge of. You know, rolling gear into the room, doing the electrical tie-in. Uh, he was mixing the headliners. Also teching keyboards. I think he teched <laughs> drums. Um, their monitor tech was teching some of the instruments. One of the band members, a uh, guy that played key and sex, was driving one of the buses. <laughs> so um, it's uh, that just goes to prove that you need to be diverse if you're going to get work on the on I think, the touring circuit. I think that was our biggest setback in the morning trying to do loading, but they couldn't move the bus because by law they have to have eight hours of sleep. And he was at like seven and we had to wait for another hour for him to be able to actually get it like to move that bus yep so we just kind of sat around eight ten bits for a while (laughs) (laughs) but uh so yeah it was it was a cool experience um again i was really nervous just because i mean it's it's some bigger i've been doing this a long time but those bigger boys than i generally get to play with and there's always that like I, i don't know like nobody really had a chip on their shoulder but i would i'm so much more comfortable cramming my stuff into a venue Right. With my crew and my gear than being the venue and, you know, hoping that everything that went back and forth in the rider actually got <laughs> discussions. Done. Yeah. yeah, got done. And uh, honestly, most of the stuff like tech wise, they didn't need anything from us. Like they asked. Generator. Um, well, yeah, yeah, they they asked for a 100 amp tie in, which we didn't have readily available. And actually, I threw a clamps on the uh, during the headliner or not during the headliner, but during. Uh, well, what would have been the headliner during Big Daddy's set? I went yeah. through clamps on the cam locks. 40 amps per, le- per leg. That was it. That's not too bad. That was a 100% LED show, LED yeah. wall, uh, really pretty efficient uh, Nexo line arrays. Those, we need to talk about those subs. The subs. Oh, God. Now, I don't know anybody that's a big fan of Nexo <laughs> stuff. Like I know a lot of guys use them. They get installed <laughs> in churches. I mean, for compact boxes, I feel like they really do pretty well, and they're yeah. they're definitely cheaper than like the Nexo or the uh, like the VDOSC. Caras and yeah, <laughs> other compact solutions. <laughs> they're they're a couple countries worth of money less than yeah, like the budget of of a small Scandinavian nation <laughs> in difference. And you can have ten boxes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they had they had ten Nexo boxes on either side, and I think I didn't really look into them, but they, well, they were like a, a dual eight and a bunch of highs or dual tens. I don't yeah. think they were tens. I think they were pretty I think small. They were eights. Like yeah. the boxes were maybe eighteen inches wide at most, and yep. I'm thinking like sixteen or fourteen. Um, they were just cool looking. Like I was wheeling in these boxes that were about six feet tall. Didn't really think about it, and then opened it up and saw them just 
hook some chain into it and pull out a line array like, oh, well, that's what's in there. And like totally unassuming, especially when they're sitting on top of two twenty ones on yeah. the ground. So, but, yeah, that was pretty cool. Like they're small enough that they can keep five of them pre-rigged vertical in a I road case. It, it was ten. I think it was all ten at the same time, wasn't it? Or no, were there no, four? No, because they, they took five up and then they'd link up. Oh, you okay. were you were behind the, the LED right, wall when yeah. they did that. Yeah. Um, LED wall was pretty cool too. But. That was pretty sick. It was a uh, I can't. I wish I remember the name of it, but it was super slick. I mean, infinitely expandable. It was these panels that were about eighteen by thirty, maybe eighteen by. Tw- I think they were just two by three. I felt like they were a little smaller than that. Were they? Okay. Maybe a foot and a half by not quite. Three feet, sure. foot but, and a half by two and a half. But yeah, they just you just bolt together as many of them as you want, patch yeah. them all in. If it gets too big, you add more rigging and more power supplies and mm-hmm. video boosters and whatnot, and you just pipe video to them suckers and off it you just go. Goes, yeah, it was it was great. Like I'd I'd never put one of those before or put one of those together before, and it just it's fantastic. It, it looked great. It just uh, it was it had a six six degree pitch on it so i think that's what it's six millimeters in between each led or something like that even less than that um it was it was great yeah they were they were really tight mm-hmm. and it looked yeah looked like a million bucks like but you didn't need to be more than about 20 feet away from it before it really started to come together and it, mm-hmm. from the back of the house it was smooth oh, yeah. silk. it was great upstairs so yeah they had uh, 10 nexo boxes either side and I don't know. I've, I've mixed on them in different configurations where there would be like a center cluster of right. you know, a single array. Some you know, but they they threw into the balcony really well. I think they had probably four or five directed into the balcony, and then the rest of them taking care of the lower part of the room. Yeah. And uh, but I don't know. They're they're Nexos. They have they, they have that Nexo sound. It's kind of hard to put your finger on. That's because Yamaha makes them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's and that's uh, and is. the headliner was mixing on a. It was an Alan and Heath I Live? No, no. That, well, that, oh, that, that was, was the first two guys. Oh, okay. All right. But uh, the Jeremy Camps set was on uh, Yamaha M7? Yes. M7CL? Yeah. And No, no. it was a PM5D because they had a PM5D for... Or wait, no. Hold no, on. no, 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 no. Oh, they were M7s. I'm sorry. Yep, yep. Yeah, M7s for front and monitors. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the first two sets, uh, Alan and Heath I Live... Which I thought sounded better through the Nexos than the Yamaha. It doesn't sound like a Yamaha. Exactly. That's that's... <laughs> if you run running ice cubes into ice cubes, all you're going to get are <laughs> get more ice cubes. <laughs> Just bigger ice cubes. See, I, I think people, the people I talked to through the day were expecting me to be kind of salivating over it. And I was like, oh, it definitely sounds better than our stuff, but this isn't what I would buy. <laughs> for. No. Can you hear Anthony shaking his head? Vigorously hear <laughs> shaking my head. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the next was just, I mean, the, it was, it was really nice to hear my room in stereo to hear panning that actually yeah. did something, uh, <laughs> cause I'm stuck with a mono mix. Um, but the, the definition was nice and it really, it wasn't much louder. I mean, we mixed Sunday mornings at 94 DB, a weighted slow response and I pulled my meter out during the headlining set and doing 96, I think we, eh, they touched Maybe. 98, but okay. yeah, I mean, not, it was not much louder than, I mean, it definitely was, it was less than twice as loud. It was, you know, uh, more yeah. than more than twice as much sonic energy, but right. it wasn't twice as much uh, perceived volume. Yeah. But the re- the thing that really made it, and if you're looking at Nexo stuff, the subs. They don't sound like Yamahas. That's the, yeah. <laughs> that, like, that's the off-the-bat selling point for me. Like I saw them pull them out, looking at them, like, I thought I was rolling in bass cabinets. At the time, I was like, oh, okay. Go. I was like, why are there four of them? What the hell are these guys doing? And then saw, you know, all right, drop that, kick it on its side, pick up that one, throw it on top. Like, oh, okay. And I didn't find out what was in them until later in the day. You peeped in through the grill and saw those 21s. <laughs> They're car tires. What the yeah. hell? But, and in some kind of weird, like, it was, I, I haven't looked them up yet online, but, like, you looking in through the grill, you're looking at the back of a 21, cocked yeah. at a 45-degree angle. So there's some kind of weird... That's like what, folded horn scoop, or were they isobaric? Was there another one in there behind it? Uh, they weren't that heavy. I don't know, unless the you know they didn't have giant magnets. But like mine are, I've got eighteens that are inverted, forty five degrees, and the the bottom shoots out on an angle, yeah. and they definitely hit harder. But I don't. But they were real yeah. tight for being oh twenty one inch cones. I've never so, heard they sounded as I tight think as they a were fifteen, a, a cardioid box or something. Because walking really? back and forth, like there really wasn't a power alley. 
No. Like, standing at the mix was not that much different from standing way off to one side. And even up in the balcony, you could still feel it in your yeah. chest. Oh, yeah. It like, was nice. It, oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the Nexo subs, they got some, some nice magic there's some, going yeah, on in there. some crazy voodoo up in those joints. Yeah. So then we... Uh, let me see. We got there at 8, started loading in about 9.30. Those guys were out of the building at 10 after 1. Yeah. And then we got fixed for church because I was going to be gone on a movie shoot the next day, and Anthony was going to be mixing my service, so it had to be <laughs> red to go It was <laughs> before I walked out. It was a rough day. Yeah. Loading, yeah, loading at, well, 9, and then couldn't actually get into the bus until 10.30 because the guy had to get his eight hours of sleep. Did load in, had to leave, go to my church for work. Hurt your back? Hurt, yeah, well, hurt my back trying to grab one of those Nexo boxes from rolling off and tipping over, because whoever the chick volunteer that we had was like, oh, I think I got it, and didn't, did not got it. I didn't it. realize that was where you heard it. I th- yeah. Oh, man. It didn't set until later, because I thought I, I pulled something kind of funny, and I just, after that, as soon as I sat down at work, I was like, oh, God, well, let's just start eating Motrin like candy right now, and hope i can walk later um yeah. so then did that did wedding rehearsal did something else came back to the church hung out there for a bit came home to sleep ate some more motrin then went back at like what eleven thirty or midnight or something like that yeah to help finish load out and uh and we parted ways in the parking lot a touch <laughs> before three <laughs> and then i was i got up at i actually overslept i got up at almost mm-hmm. eight the next morning so I, I got close to five hours of sleep and uh went off and did a movie shoot yeah, that was like three days of f- four hour sleep, followed by a fourteen or sixteen or twenty hour day. That was I yeah. was pretty whipped. The time yeah. I got done with that run, it was a long weekend. The week wasn't the week after that wasn't too much better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I spent my third day, the third day of the shoot. Well, it was con- concert day of shooting at a farmhouse, which was long. We were on site for twelve hours, yeah. and, and but then the following day was all almost all riding around in the back of a, a jeep. <laughs> Not a was it a Liberty, probably Cherokee. Cherokee is it, was, it like mine? Yeah, yeah, it's Cherokee or Grand Cherokee. Yeah, so yeah, it was a Grand Cherokee. So there was there was like two actors in the front seats with cameras suction cupped to windows and things, and then me in the back seat with a zoom and a couple lavalier mics, and then my boss directing from the <laughs> luggage area, and sometimes accompanied by a second camera. <laughs> That's rough. Operator. Like I had a hard time, because uh, when I worked at Stakeout and got out at like 5 in the morning, but had to be back to open at 9, Like there was no way I was going home, so just, damn, fly. Get out of here. Um, I would just sleep in the car, just pop open the, the glass, stick my feet out, and put a note on the door. If I'm not in by 9 o'clock, come in and honk the horn in my car. <laughs> But but I mean that's that's tight for one guy, <laughs> much less a video crew. <laughs> yeah, but that was a cool day, and I actually got some decent results out of the Zoom. Like it that's was good. it was definitely showing its limitations as a device. But and it's it's not really for that though. Like that's the, well, or did you have mics plugged into the? I had mics plugged oh, into okay, it too. All right. So yeah, and I'm actually I'm I'm gonna use a little bit of the built-in mics just okay. for ambience. Yeah. But yeah, the majority of it was just to get these two labs, and I well. I had been plagued with some low-level issues. Like I have actors that want to slip into a whisper, and just you know, just kind of talk like this, and which is pretty hard. To, I mean, I can pick it up, and you can hear it, but I can't There's bring it so up enough. Much noise. I can't bring it up enough to play in a theater or on a TV. So we've had to do some ADR for that, um, and we didn't have that problem in the car. But I think the reason was because of the road noise and you know a V8 right. and tire noise and wind noise. They someone, did what you do in a someone car. Someone into one of the rumble strips. And- yeah. <laughs> They they did what people do in a car and they talked louder for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was at times, uh, you know, there were some some pretty loud <laughs> sounds coming out of the actors. So I got into the limiters, which was not super pretty. <laughs> it's <laughs> but ADR. That's what's well, all. Well, nah, nah, I'm just gonna go with it. I'll, <laughs> I haven't sat down to cut that scene yet, but I I think it's all usable. So there's that. <laughs> and then you showed up sometime at like. Ten thirty or eleven, we're like, is John coming over? I don't know. Yeah, because I a couple knock, nights knock, a week. I'll, oh yeah, <laughs> John's here. A couple nights a week, I stay here at the uh, the Shea Cousin Bucky, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just I, I just walked in, <laughs> took my shoes off, almost killed the cat. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first. Where's the cat? Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, that was that was an adventure, um, and we don't we don't say all that stuff to sound like we're we're bigger and badder than anybody, just to give a realistic picture of what production looks like when you get on into the it. low end, on like the very low end. <laughs> so yeah, we're a couple notches above doing it on a shoestring, but uh, I mean, if we were independently wealthy, this is what we'd still be doing yeah. to fill up the hours. Mm-hmm. So pretty cool, and actually, we uh, I felt bad because one of the nights, I think it was Sunday night, and I only had one more day left, and it wasn't going to be a full day even. Yeah, um, I think it's yeah. That was another yeah. showed up. Super we cool. want to play yeah. Wii bowling until the wee hours. Oh yeah, listen to Volbeat and playing Wii bowling until like three in the morning, and then it wasn't quite like... that late. But uh, that night, I show up and we wound up talking shop for pretty much an hour. <laughs> I was like, man, I should have pressed record on that. Yeah. So we did deprive you of a podcast, although it was, I don't know, shop talk here is usually interspersed with like we also talk about Star Trek and whatever's on TV at the moment <laughs> and. Magic box. Cat food and... <laughs> Sriracha. Yeah. Um, and whatever the hell we're going to do with that ham that's sitting on my coffee table. Yeah, you need to start beheading that thing and <sighs> yeah. toss the chassis. So uh, the other thing, let me see. We've only been at it a little over 20 minutes. This could be a short one, too. We don't have to yeah. wind it all the way out. Um, we're going to talk about some new gear that we saw coming out. Um, I can't remember if I mentioned this on the last podcast or not. I may have found out about this since then, but our buddy Ika over in Germany, good in good in Nock, or is it is it Tog over there now? I forget. Uh, I'm I'm Jewish. You really might, expect me to be? It might be almost uh, Tog. It might be almost day by the, at this <laughs> point. Um, but anyway, our buddy Ika uh, has been sniffing around the Behringer X32 digital console. Oh, really? Um, Anthony and I haven't taken a field trip to see one yet, uh, but they do have them in town, so we can, we're going to go, when things lighten up a little bit, lay hands on one. But uh, Ika came back with the report that it was more solidly built than he expected it to be. Uh, everything was sort of just as the hype and the propaganda had said. And uh, he liked it enough to shell, I don't know how many euros it was, but I think they really? list for 2900 bucks American. I thought they were thirty-two. I've seen them online for twenty-nine. Let's let's use the magic of Apple and find out. Anthony's going to look into that. But anyway, for roughly three grand, you get a fully automated digital console with the capability of of using digital snakes. Um, and uh, he pointed out the uh, the control software is available, but only for PC at this point. So I haven't gotten around to loading that up on anything to take a look at it but uh, at any rate um ike has got one went out and bought one he is going to be taking it out a couple of times this month uh november 2012 and has promised us some write-ups some thoughts possibly some videos um and actually i was i was pretty pleased to, to hear like he thought the the only things that he didn't like about it was stuff that could have been corrected with a firmware update really yeah so it's it's a penny off of three grand Okay, so yeah. I think I, somebody had it for like twenty eight ninety nine. Oh, yeah, whatever. But yeah, right around. That there. might have been an introductory thing. So anyway, yeah, those are those are out there. Uh, we're gonna be looking into those. But the other thing is, uh, and I had seen this popping up somewhere. I I kind of ignored it because it's one of those things like, eh, I'm never gonna have that. Right. Or at least not for quite a few, like maybe in ten years when everybody's making one of these. But uh, <clears throat> Stephen Slate has just come out with this thing. What's it called? The Raven. The Ra- uh, Raven MTX. It like what. What baffles me about Steve Slate is that if I saw him on the street, I would think he's the biggest douchebag in the entire world. He's got chains and goofy rings, and he just, he kind of just... He's looking kind of GQ. He, he's a little bit more, like, he's a little more gay Chris Angel, is what he is. <laughs> like, that, that, like... In, but he makes I'm, such good I, stuff. Exactly. Like, I can't actually knock the guy because he doesn't put out anything bad, and it's all, like, fairly cheap for... For what it is, like all his plugins are, they top out of two hundred bucks, and they're fantastic. They are all really, oh really God. good. Um, and even some of the the actual hardware stuff, he's got the Dragon and the Fox Quad Pro and something else. But this Raven MTX, uh, there's one his propaganda video for. It. They just released it at AES like two. So let's three well, let's weeks set ago. the product up a little bit. If you haven't seen these things, uh, there's very few pictures of it floating around. But like uh, somebody did an Apple parody. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you've seen the Apple commercials where somebody's playing Heart and Soul on an iPad and then mm-hmm. somebody's playing the Melody line on an iPad mini, yeah. somebody took that a step further and there was like, you keep scrolling to the right and there's an iPhone with a couple keys of a piano <laughs> on it and then an iPod Nano with like one key of a piano on it and then they keep scrolling, keep scrolling and somebody had you know faked it up to look like somebody was playing piano on the screen of an iMac. <laughs> he saw that, not really, but you know, like he, he's, he took that and said, yeah, that's that's cool. 
let's blow it up and make it real. Um, so, yeah, you got this thing. It's basically, what, like a 48-inch diagonal measure, yep. ultra-definition uh, TV, touchscreen. Yeah, yeah it's a, no, it's a, it's a, I think it's a 40, yeah, 42 or 48-inch um, touchscreen. Um, and w- what it is is it's... Um, it, it plugs, it's an iPad for your DAW. It's a remote right. for yeah for um, any major DAW. And and the way they they've done it, like it's not like they went out and bought a bunch of you know LCDs. Like it's they actually built it. Um, and and from what he said, like the the touch screen capability is actually more precise than what he said is the major leading tablet. Because I don't <laughs> think he has enough money <laughs> to say iPad and he can't get mention, his ball suit off. Or, can't mention Apple in the promo. But, uh, yeah, the glass is smoother, cleaner, thinner, more clearer, responsive. more touch responsive, more oil resistant than uh, than, than your eye device. Um, so it's... You know, it's everything. It's transport control. It's monitoring. And it's got real VUs on the top. It has, it has half the, a dozen analog VUs. That's the sickest part about it. Like, it's like, uh, what did he, he said? It's, it's digitally controlling your analog console or your analog world. Like something along those lines. Well, that was, that was the analog, the monitoring section. It's, it's the analog circuitry in the monitor section is all digitally controlled. Okay. So you don't have to worry about like scratchy pots and whatnot. Right, yeah. And on the analog outs, that's all digitally controlled too. Mm-hmm. And it's totally user customizable, so you can pick whatever your hotkeys are. There's there's a stash of actual keys, like actual buttons, and it looks yeah. like so you've the, got like stu- like transport buttons that look like they came Studer. off a Studer and <laughs> uh, some shiny V pots with LED rings right. around them. You can, and, you can put your iPhone in, but it's diagonal; it's not just straight. So yeah, it's, it's, more, it's at it's a more jaunty flashy. angle. It's, it's the gay Chris Angel touch. Works better at forty five degrees. <laughs> Um, um, USB ports in the front of it. Just like, it's it seems pretty well thought out. The only thing is, and this is probably just a me thing, but like I always want to run my computers at the just the maximum balls out resolution they can have, mm-hmm. so that I can make like my fonts really, really, really tiny and still be able to read them. Like it looked like you couldn't fit more than twenty four faders on the screen at a time. I think so. I don't know if you can if you can shift sizes or what on that. Yeah, but. I, I I feel like if I have that much space in front of me, like I could fit eighteen on the screen of my MacBook, and I have a little one. Right. So like, if I'm going to invest in a billboard of a DAW control, I feel like I want to be able to see <laughs> a couple of more tracks on yeah. there. So I don't know. Maybe that's a feature you can adjust, or maybe that'll be coming with firmware. But I don't know. I'm looking at it, and I'm not super excited by it. Like, really? I'm doing pretty well on a thirteen inch MacBook with the trackpad. Like. I like I like the ability like even though you're not actually touching faders, you can touch something and like you can instead of because with even with the trackpad, how many you can move one fader at a time, right? Yeah. Like if it's not grouped out and stuff. So, but with this, you can actually independently pull up groups, pull up a set of faders like you want, the overheads and the snare, at the same time to come up. So you can actually draw on your automation like that with those faders. Oh, yeah. Well, you can do that. Uh, it's a little bit of a workaround, but like if you have an iPad. You can mm-hmm. use some of the screen expanding utilities. I've actually done this with my iPod. Um, <laughs> That's gonna get rough. <laughs> it's well, can yeah, you imagine. can't actually mix on it, but like you, it'll it'll it supports multi touch right. if you use it with an Apple. So like you you could fake it to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. Thing is though, I'm not sure how much I need it. Like how many times am I gonna put ten digits on the screen? Like I just in my mixing. Right. I don't do that when I have analog faders. Like I group <laughs> stuff out and I use my VCAs and I or you know if I'm in, in the right. box I'm I'm making stems. I feel like I could efficiently mix. Well, I don't even have one now. Like I don't have a single real like real estate fader to use. Like I, I keep pondering. Like eh, maybe someday I'll, I'll try and invest in one of those little eight motorized fader mm-hmm. plus knobs plus transport controls deals. Right. And I'm like, meh. You know, like I don't I don't That's... mix stuff that has a bazillion tracks in it. Like I get up in the mid thirties for a lot of stuff that I do. Right. And. You know, by the time I've grouped it out and mixed my subgroups, I'm I'm really not touching much by the end of it. Like, I don't know. We'll get into this more when we get into the anatomy <laughs> of a mix. Like, yeah. I'm I don't know. I just I don't I don't see the need for it myself. Although I didn't see the need for digital consoles when they came out either, and now I'm I'm itching to get one. Right. Um. So There's, yeah. I mean, like, I'm itching to go back analog. I was looking around at um, this guy. It's Toft's Audio Designs. Um, and this guy is actually the guy that helped design the original Trident consoles. Ooh. And it's along the same lines, but it's an actual, you can get anywhere, I think, from 8 to 32 real physical faders, real channel strips for like 8 grand, but it plugs straight into your DAW. 
so you can it's a control surface but it's got trident pre's in it which are pretty hard to come by I like the original ones and they're new but this guy built the originals so it's got some juice behind it I like that yeah see I'm I guess I'm waiting for if I'm gonna really go all out and get an interface to go along with a DAW I just I feel like I want it to be a little bit more Tony Stark like <laughs> I want it to play back in black and brew me a coffee and fire up a hologram <laughs> when I walk into the room in the morning you know <laughs> like by the time we have enough money to do something like that, it'll it'll probably be like that. Sweet. Sweet. All right. So I'm holding out. But anyway, that's that's out. I feel like that's kind of the next evolutionary step for a DAW interface. So it's cool to see that somebody took the plunge. And it's it's easy to criticize. I mean, nobody can mm-hmm. say whether it's useful or not because nobody's ever used one. Yeah, it's, they don't. It's, you can't. I can't find a price on it. Nothing. Well, and it just got released. It's not like there's released. anything else like that. Like you can connect exactly. and you can you can make your iPad talk to almost anything, but mm-hmm. this is like having a big screen iPad yeah. that's, that's and not just an app, like some sort of kludgy app. Like this is a, like it's built to minimal run with pro tools, yeah. logic, Cubase, and, and like the other yeah. big ones, minimal, minimal latency, no lag time. No, mm-hmm. I put my finger on a fader and slide it and I wait for it to move. Like it's, it's with, with you. you. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. And nobody's, this is the, this is the first of its kind. So there certainly will be a lot of people, Skeptical, mocking of it, um, you know, and who knows? It might take till there's a third of its kind or a fifth of its kind or right. a twentieth of its kind to really nail a product that all the engineers are going to, you know, that, right. that's going to be a I mean, sea change to like, all right, you know, it went from everybody's working on a console to everybody's working in the box to, you know, this is the next big thing, I think, mm-hmm. to to get I mean, people. Dave, Dave Pensato and Tony, Tony Maserati both said they loved it. So that's that's something. That's a good step guys that right lo- there. Guys that really, really love their knobs are willing <laughs> to use this thing. That's saying something. That's all right. So I may I'll shut up. <laughs> that's, still that, that was my first note that I heard about. It. They're like our buddy Steve Slate over at Slate Pro Audio just released a real cool new thing. And AES is like, what did he do now? What I need to know what he did now. <laughs> and my drummer ended up. He's like, you got to check this thing out and showed up with the video. It's like, yep, yeah. That's bigger than my TV in my house. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Play videos on that sucker. Yep. Although it looks, I mean, it's a reach. Like, I feel like my arms would be tired after mixing on that yeah. all day. Yeah. I so, mean, there's a reason that most consoles are pretty, almost, yeah. almost flat. Yeah. Like, maybe 30 degree pitch. Yeah, on, actually, but. what it reminded me of was, like, the old school uh, Soundcraft theater consoles that had a super, <laughs> super steep rake in, in the back. 90 degree rake, straight up. Uh, it was like no, almost I, 45, it was like 40 yeah. on the yeah. back. So, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if ergonomically you can sit at one of those things for 6 or 8 or 14 hours right. and not have your shoulders feel like they're hanging on by pieces of butcher string. <laughs> uh, all right, so I think we beat that one to death, and we've still got half the podcast to go. All right, so... Um, do you have anything? No, but you do. All right. So I got some awesome news and then I got some more awesome news and then it went back to just okay news. <laughs> uh, <laughs> still pretty good news. It's still pretty good news. Someone, I, I, I threw something up on the blog cause neither one of us have had a chance to, I forgot about the playlist thing. Actually, I should do that again. Um, but threw something up asking you guys if you had not unlimited, but but a pretty substantial amount of money to put into designing a studio. Now, I've got some stuff, um, say, start out with a Pro Tools HD rig and then build it up from there. What would you bring in? Like, what hardware would you want? What plugins would you want? What microphones would you really need to have? And I put together a pretty freaking killer list, um, totaling somewhere around 115 grand, mm-hmm. and uh, there is still room to play. Um, and then the bottom dropped out. And then the bottom dropped out. <laughs> so, like, going from someone said, well, someone wants to invest $10,000. Like, that's awesome. We can get some cool stuff with that. And then someone out of thin air and bounced a rumor around long enough, we're like, oh, it's not 10000 it's 250000 I was like, oh, damn. <laughs> Daddy needs a catalog. Um, <laughs> and, and got overwhelmed to the point where I was like, I can't, like, I, I was thinking about everything, like, replacement fuses for the Furmans and stuff like <laughs> it was on the list no joke <laughs> on the list and I got to a point where I couldn't like my brain was beyond fried and I actually laid face down on the floor in my office for 15 minutes and probably drooled for a while just to calm myself down <laughs> and then but I still <laughs> right but like unbl- like stuff that you're like I'll never have that and everything but 
the day after that, I got a message saying, yeah, no, it's 10 grand. Sorry. Um, so back, back to <laughs> the original 10 grand with the list that I crumpled up and threw in the garbage and said, ha, that's bullshit. Um, <laughs> when I went back to, uh, the original list and I'm really like, I want to get one really nice mic, like a mic that you say you've got and people want to come in to use it. So I'm either thinking, it's going to be annoying, it's either a, um, a M147, which is a large diaphragm tube condenser mic, um, or a U87. Probably going to go with the U87, because you say, oh, an M147, most people know what that is, but if you say, oh, I've got a U87... Like, oh, do you? I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> um, so sticking with that, like I've got the KSM-44s and one of the other kids that's helping me out that has a decent locker full of stuff. He's got some AT-4050s, a um, bunch of SM-81s. Like he's got he's got some good stuff um, and some good instruments that he can bring in too. So say we do the Neumann U87, what, what pre's, what channel strips do I really want to get? to work in because that's that's a thirty three hundred dollar microphone just for that so where where do i go from there like focus right liquid <laughs> but that that only gives me i think two liquid channels at once um and the other one's just regular focus right breeze right now the focus right sound good for sure but um <clears throat> i want something with a little bit more flavor i guess like something like not to sound douchey but like turn into a certain type of studio like that's why we go to different studios somebody's got an ssl desk someone's got a need desk, somebody's got an api somebody's got a trident or some of the other stuff so out of the most i've been digging around i think i want to get an avalon 737 to run that neumann through but for pre's and stuff um did a lot of digging around talked to brian moore actually about it a little bit um and the consensus seems to be I'm going to get a couple, they're one rack space, API 3124s. Mm. So API pre's. So there's there's four of them in a rack, but that rack of four is three grand. So already I'm, I'm getting more. $6,500 <laughs> including like shipping and stuff. So is that the way to go or what do you, do you have other options other than the focus right thing? Because I've got a couple focus right pre's now yeah. that I can incorporate. Well, my thoughts are, if I think if I was doing this, um, and this is assuming you've already got you know Pro Tools HD and you've got a fair number of in-out mm-hmm. devices, so yeah, what are you right. what are you looking at for your custom stuff? I think in my mind, I'm probably dividing it pretty close to in half, although maybe spending a little bit less on microphones. Mm-hmm. But uh, think for me lately, and uh, I don't know if I'll ever get to a point where I'm doing this, but lunchbox like 500 series modules are just making my blood pressure go up lately. Right. Like I, I have them They're for nice. the background of my phone and my iPod, and I just <laughs> I spend my lunch hour looking at pictures of 500 modules. Yep. I don't even know what any of them sound like, but I just I, I love the concept and I love the scale of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I know a lot of guys like to walk into a studio and see you know floor to ceiling racks of big four and five space you know RCA it's stuff 18. from. 18 manly massive passives in a row. Why Why not? Why not? Yeah. yeah. Um, They're only seven grand a piece. So. Right. So, yeah, to go really, really big, you can't do it for 10 grand. No, no um, not at all. And also, for what plugins cost, when you can get, you know, the Slate stuff and mm-hmm. the Massey stuff, like, uh, actually, now I'm thinking you probably need to divide it, uh, like, sort of, I would say maybe four grand for mics. Mm-hmm. Two grand for plugins, three grand for lunchbox stuff. Because um, yeah, sometimes you re- you just really do need to do stuff in the analog realm. Or if I'm going to go out and get stuff remote, um, mm-hmm. which I tend to do, like I want my stuff to be portable. Like I I love the idea of having a you know a mahogany paneled room with floor to ceiling racks of ancient. <laughs> tube gear that my little guy comes in and maintains for me but like i, I you never little, see him you never hear him he's, well, he's, he's a little japanese guy with a german accent and a lab coat <laughs> that's that's who i that's imagine a, that's exactly who you want working on right? <laughs> so, um but yeah i mean uh, i'm mike choices i don't know I, I i want i don't need that stratospheric mic for my philosophy of things mm-hmm. um i feel like you can take some stuff that's a lot less expensive than 
you know, like, uh, not saying that what Anthony's doing is wrong, but like I know guys will spend, you know, the rent money amounts. on yeah. on these stratospheric mics, and the stuff doesn't necessarily sound any better than stuff that guys are doing with stuff they bought at Guitar Center. So, yep. I think I would rather have more mics than base it around like a flagship mic. Like my flagship mic might be like an SM7. Yeah, yeah. We want to work in an RE20 as well, because the oh for sure, for like sure. they're they're just great on everything. Like I've heard vocals that Joe's recorded, and I can't tell the difference between when he records with an RE20 or when he records with a Neumann. Mm-hmm. I really can't. Like there's, I almost like the RE20 better. It's it's got more presence to it than because he's got one of the TLM 103s. So they're they're nice, but they're not. You know they're transformerless, so there's they're missing that little bit of magic. But mm-hmm. see, so, yeah, I think like my philosophy, I don't, I don't necessarily have like a dream mic. And actually, a lot of the stuff that I would pick to use in the studio is just stuff that I'm familiar with from working live. That because honestly, stuff <laughs> the stuff that's out on stages is getting really pretty good. That was that was my one. The uh, the other kid that's helped me out with this um, sent the list that I'd made the ten grand list down to his buddy in Nashville, who's a producer and. No joke. He's like, the priests seem really solid. The channel strips are great. It seems like a live guy picked out your microphones, though. I was like, son of a bitch. God, I thought I was really making something. Uh, I thought I was getting somewhere. I think I was getting out of that. Because, like, I didn't have anything crazy in there. I was like, I don't... Like, get a $1,000 blue. Do a blueberry. Those sound really good. Get... I've got every... I can't, again, I think- I can't seem to get rid of my 57s. They just keep showing up. But I don't they're know just good for everything. <laughs> <I know. laughs> like, you give you give me something to record and a fifty seven to record it with. I'll get you the track yeah. guaranteed every mm-hmm. time. And uh, I don't know. I think that's something that we bring to it, being that we've both done so much live sound. Yeah. Like, okay, we're not coming from that. You know, like you know, cr- <laughs> crunch up some mahogany and snort it kind of mindset. <laughs> like, oh yes, I'll take the uh, Neumann and then I run it through the Massey and then I find that. Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I'm too tired to do work very well. Was you, on the Daily Show the other night, they were talking about um, how how they legalized recreational use of of weed in, in Colorado, Colorado. And uh, John Daly was like, "You know how the people on Wall Street haven't heard of it?" And he gets this accent, and he's like, "I can't snort off a hooker's tea. It ain't worth my time." <laughs> family show <laughs> it's after 10 o'clock i can say whatever i want on prime time right now uh we're 26 episodes and if people haven't learned that things get a little bit randy on here 20, 26 episodes and boy like 80 hour work weeks for like <laughs> the last couple work weeks so right okay so yeah both of our our dream ten ten thousand dollar studios would would probably be full of a lot of live mics but i feel like it's variety that i want more than a flagship mic that I do everything with. And I know there are uh, there are big time engineers that go both ways. Like, exactly. you know, Bruce Swedeen who's got his you know, he's just got some amazing mics, historic epic mics. But there are also guys that pull out fifty sevens for a lot of stuff that you yeah. couldn't guess. Mm-hmm. And that I mean, the reason I'm looking for that one flagship right now is because I've got a decent collection of typical every like I've got eighty ones, I've got your Beta 52, and uh, I've got a 91, and I've got an i5, I've got more 57s that I know what to do with. I just start leaving them places and see if I can find them at the end of the week, really. <laughs> no joke. Like, I'll put one in a bag, I'll leave it on a table, and see if it's there. Well, I'm a little short, so if any of them need to disappear for a while, I, I would take them as collateral for <laughs> for all your crap that I've my had Mike's and my Joe Meek. And, um, uh, so I've got those. I've got the KSM-44s, which are really good for vocals, especially, like, if I got an Avalon, through, throw them through that, they sound killer. They're super warm and rich, but they're not too flabby. They're, there's enough high end on them, and those, along with the pair of AT forty fifties that the other kids got, we've got I think in between us like six or eight SM eighty ones, D one twelves. He's got a sub kick. He's got you know uh, he also has a, a stupid wealth of fifty sevens, um, but we've got a pretty good spread of stuff. Like I'd really like like to get a really something that'll bring people in because we're not doing it just to have it like we want to actually make money with it so you say you've got you've got that kind of microphone you've got this kind of preamp that you run it through people recognize what it is and sometimes they're a little bit more apt to spend some time and work with you just because they want to use it Mm because people are egocentric like that yeah 
That's why I picked the mic. <laughs> so yeah, there's my my mic philosophy. Um, plug in wise, like yeah, mm-hmm. if I'm I'm if I want like the manly and the Poltec and the uh, like the Fairchild, Fairchild, Harrison, like all that stuff, um, Massenburg. You can yep. get it all as plugins, and it's maybe not quite the same as having the real deal analog units. But, but you can put it on every single channel. Exactly. Without spending eighty thousand dollars. You can put them on everything, and also every time you pull it up, you don't have to worry about is something going to break? Is something? Gonna oh god, be- the voltage is one twenty, not one twenty two. <sighs> Right. Yeah. There's so there's a lot of stuff that you don't have to worry about that you can pull up these classic sounds and have them be the same and not worry about like, all right, I'm working in a different room. Is you know like when I send this out to mix, is his manly going to sound different than my manly? Is his Poltec mm-hmm. have newer tubes in it or different whatever you know? So there is the consistency of plugins. Uh, but yeah. then I think for uh, on the actual real world, like in <laughs> not virtual space gear. I'm not really reaching for the stars on that either. Um, I'd be looking for like a Pro VLA because mm-hmm. that's it's just a really nice compressor. It's uh, yeah. that's not something that I would get for like because of the particular you know not one of those things I would like plug in and leave it turned off right. just to shape the sound. I would plug it in when I need to do a buttload of compression and I don't want to hear it. Exactly. So that would be my juice box for that. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, the rest would just be for 500 series modules. I, I would probably sign up for the Module of the Month Club. And Those are like, like for the good ones, are like, even the, the, they're like. They're a thousand bucks. Yeah. So, like, I can get half a lunchbox. <laughs> I can get the lunchbox and fill half the lunchbox and be. That's, a, yeah, I wouldn't, done, I wouldn't have a whole, you know, ten, eight or ten. I'd have like a four or maybe even just. A, that little three that a they got. A three would be nice. Because, yeah, if you had a, a killer pre. A killer EQ and a killer mm-hmm. comp. Yeah, that's it. That's your box, and you can take it with you when you go. Like that and, can be and your you thing. Can mix and match stuff. Like that's the but. Like get an SSL pre in there, and then an API EQ, and then a uh, something from Chandler for the compression. Yeah, or, like one of those. I think they make the, the germanium ones. Mm-hmm. So that like and you know swap out bits and pieces. Like if you want a solid API channel strip, then you got it. But everything else you can pick in and out because I love. For certain stuff, like for overheads and stuff, I'd rather have like some of the Vintex stuff or, or or the Neves stuff for overheads. But for toms, I want I want API pre's for toms. Uh-huh. Um, and for kicking stuff, I really like the way SSL stuff sounds for kicking and, and snare. But for the toms, like the main the main goal of the API would be for honestly, I'd probably run the kick through the Avalon if I were able to get that, and then run snare and. Uh, the toms through the api just to just to beef them up because there's there's this nifty little mid-range punch that they, they just have yep to them well the nice thing about the a module is face it you are never ever ever going to borrow somebody's man, massive passive or poltec yeah. eq or you know massenberg compressor like that's that's just not ever coming out of somebody's rack to right. go over to your place for a bit mm-hmm. um doesn't matter who you know doesn't matter who you family show um but it's modules a little word yeah like uh-huh. modules i i mean there's not a community around here that's swapping stuff out but i feel like it'd be easier to get your hands on you know even though it's still a 500 to 1500 dollar box yeah piece at a time you're like oh hey I'll, you know i'll trade you my chandler little devil for your api pre or your yeah. you know whatever and uh be able to swap some stuff around like that or you know if you if you invest heavily in racks of stuff, if you want to change stuff out or if you want to try stuff, like that's the thing about like with all the API stuff that you can get uh, to slam in there and, you know, radial. I mean, it's just the, the list mm-hmm. goes on and on and on of, of things you can get to plug into these things. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it's not cheap, but it's pretty cheap compared to get trying to get an API console oh God. or a Neve console. They, or, they don't even list the price on those. Most times it's always a call for Bryce. Like, oh yeah. You can't like if it's, cause I think they bought them out at like 70 grand for like a 32 channel or yeah. if, if it's 32 channel, I was digging around just cause it's, yeah. well, it fluctuates along with the price of unicorn horns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's we kind of we had this discussion back uh, when it was still warm weather out about you know what, what would your ten thousand dollar studio look like? So right, it was kind of a pie in the sky dream at that point. Uh, we've we've both done some research since then and come up with a little more realistic way to look at things about what to to get and to get in. Mm-hmm. 
All right. Well, have we got anything? Yeah. Still got a little bit of time left. So we're only at about the 50 minute mark. Yeah. Got anything else, sir? Um, look, I've, I've been going back and forth. Like, because we do have, like, the Avalon open up, opens up a whole bunch of worlds with what mics I can put into and have sound great on vocals. So I'm bouncing in between, like, still mentally in between that Neumann or maybe a pair of Royers. Yeah. Um, a couple ribbon mics. They're, yeah. They're really becoming an important part of things nowadays. They're, I mean, and they're they're built a lot better too. Like they can take a lot more. But for a matched pair, I think it's twenty eight hundred bucks. Where that one Neumann is thirty two, thirty three hundred. Yeah. So I can do that. Still have a little bit of play money around. Um, and they like they sound great on vocals. They sound killer on overheads. Um, for acoustic guitars, they're great. I mean, they, there's really nothing that they sound bad on, from what I've heard personally. Uh-huh. So I'd I'd be interested to see if I could find somewhere around here that'll let me demo stuff. But So I think an interesting question would be is all right, you get your, your ten K studio in and built, then what's the what's the next investment? What are you saving up for or what are you gonna buy the next big project that you get in? So like you thinking like some Sheps or some earthworks or more pre's or what? Probably more pre's. Like I really like having stuff at my fingertips that I can run through. Um, cause there, there is like, there's an analog warmth to stuff. Like I'd, I'd really like to get, um, Brian's got some of the Amic Neve 9098s and those sound gorgeous. Um, or you know what? No. Distressors. Yeah. We forgot about distressors. Yep. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Like they don't have, they don't have a 500 module for them. I've yet to find plugins for them. Like. I can't believe that either. They they would that's, sell. That's why though. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. but like, listen, bitches, you're getting these and this is what you're getting. And if you can't afford to get these, then you probably shouldn't have them. Yep. We're not going to make it That's, easy for those you. Those are actually, having listened to a few different people go through the, you know, like, what's your desert island piece of gear? Distressors come up. All the time. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, as widely diverse as you might think the answer to that question might be, dep- Distressors is the answer probably 20% of the time, which is pretty high when you think about all the stuff that's out right. there. Right. And, and that's, like, I don't, they're just compressors like they're not entire channel strips or anything so yeah. but that's the thing like guys will say oh you know i like this better than those or i like that but you know this pre this mic this whatever but distressors are just yeah darn good like, when you go on their website and you look through like the list of stuff like the list of artists it just keeps going and like i think at one point they're just like no i'm not putting another name on this good god <laughs> it's already three pages long like ev- everybody uses them they use them on Dave Rat takes them out on tour for Chris Cornell's voice. Like, just they just sound so good on everything. It, and the the more you beat them, the better they sound. Yeah. That's, like you would normally a button labeled nuke would scare me, <laughs> and it's just like candy. It's just calling. Haven't seen like, that since Doctor Strangelove. <laughs> yeah, right. Or on a piece of Behringer gear. <laughs> but uh, yeah, those things are freaking incredible. I can't. Mm-hmm. Even, yeah, they. I'm speechless at how for the money that they are. Like when you consider right. what these like, like in the Top Gear world, these are like these aren't a supercar, these aren't a hypercar. They're like a Halo car. They're just <laughs> that. That's how far you can get in the worlds of pre's and compressors and, right. and studio EQs. And the distressors are like an ultra car for the price of a Camaro. Yeah, like they're just. I mean, because you throw those up against a pair of like LA two A's or. 3As or the uh, the 1176s and stuff, and they're, I mean, they're they're cheaper. Like there's still a lot of money. Like for the for a stereo pair, or like a, a matched pair of them with the Brit mode on them, which is the nuke, yeah, thing. Like they're twenty eight fifty or twenty nine hundred. But you get a lot of other like one channel stuff, like some of the UA crap and not crap, but the UA stuff and and the um uh, I can't think of names, um, but yeah, like the the other before I get off in the world of numbers again, but <laughs> all that all that big stuff, like, you get a pair of those and you're dishing out a heck of a lot more than three grand. Oh, yeah. Especially if you get, like, the old, like, good God, I can't imagine how much a, a Fairchild 670 would run. Like, an original, cause I don't think they made those past the 60s, <clears throat> if that, and to maintain them is probably more money than I make in a year, so... Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and that's the thing. Like the distressors being newer technology, it's a lot more stable. It's a lot more reliable. You're not 
there's still people alive to fix them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some of this old stuff. I mean, part of part of that is the charm. Is that you know, studio techs in the '60s and '70s and '80s have been inside all these things and done repairs and done mods and the you know the factories updated things and. So you know you're like oh do you have one of the one you know is it is it the this face one with the that colored logo or is it the the this one with those you know right. op amps in or so there's that that sort of cachet like oh oh yeah like his studio's got one of those and it's one of the good ones like yeah but but the distressors again that's sort of it's the the analog version of the plug in like you know when you step up to a pair of distressors what you're going to get out of them mm-hmm. and they're all pretty much the same so that's yeah. Yeah, I have to, I'd have to double think about those. Although, uh, Pro VLA is a lot less than right. distressors, and yeah. I really like how those sound. Mm-hmm. So, all right, well there you go. What are we doing here? Yeah, we're getting pretty close. All right, so we <laughs> excuse me. Um, Sriracha, all per, over sort his of face, permanently dehydrated. <laughs> um, yeah, what's coming up here? I'm I'm hoping. Let me see schedule wise. For anybody who still cares to read the blog, Anthony's been floating out a couple. <laughs> We're still here, guys. Um, I was using the downtime to sort of make a plea. I was maybe hoping to hear from somebody who'd want to write. Although I did hear from uh, from Ica, he's actually thinking about writing a set of tutorials, which cool. is something I've kind of I've done a couple pages on a topic and really boiled it down to like textbook quality writing so freaking hard to do so <laughs> that's um, why we don't do that for a living right but him being german i mean he'll probably just like just sit down with his cornflakes one morning and, and blast it out but uh it, i don't know we're go, we're, go all bonhoeffer on that <laughs> we're working on something where uh if he if he if there is some interest in that uh he might be willing to translate that into english and i would be the north american editor um <laughs> that's the I, I i think he actually intends to to have some sort of compensation for that. So I don't know if it'll be for sale or if it'll be like sort of name your own price, like a Radiohead album. But uh, anyway, that's that's sort of coming up. There might be some more writing coming from him because I've been, I've been sort of pressing from uh, across the pond to have have some contributions to the website. Um, uh, let me see what else. Yeah, also if there's anybody around here that while we're not busy writing anything, if you want to <laughs> if you want to contribute. And I've had a few people say, "Oh, you know, I've got some ideas." I'm like, "No, I want I want articles. I want spell checked, proper properly formatted we'll articles. Even, we'll put your picture in them." Oh yeah. Uh so yeah, if anybody's got the the itch to write, if you've got something that you're maybe Please a little bit of a, hell. <laughs> If you're one of those guys that sort of reads and and smirks when we get something slightly wrong, Please fix it. Put your man pants on and write me an article. Or take them off if that's how you need to write that's how, Yeah, yeah. I mean, be comfortable when you write. We don't don't let me it. dictate to you how, you how you function. We won't put that picture up online. That's only for, for me and Sean. But, uh. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there's that There's that coming. I'm, I'm trying to think of my schedule. I'm thinking by – see, our, our Christmas thing peaks early. Like, we do – all our big stuff is done by, like, the second week in December. And then we've got, you know, Christmas Eve and Christmas proper and, and New Year's Eve. That's start ours. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I've been working on mine since August. So. I know. We were supposed to start then. Um, so, anyway, middle of December, I hope to be sitting down regularly. I'm, I really wanted to try and keep up the post per day at least for a year just to say that we did it. But I – it's not like we're a mommy blog or something where I can just like slap up half a paragraph about how my toddler spilled the Cheerios and have and call that a blog post. I feel like I owe you guys. Oh, we have interns though; they do that shit all the time. Can we- <laughs> my interns actually really have it together. I'm I'm oh. blessed in that. <laughs> what happened to all the bad ones? We get rid of all. <laughs> yeah, they can't hack it. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm, I'm hoping by the middle of December that I'll be posting regularly again, and I've got probably at least twenty good posts in me. Uh, just sitting there waiting to come out. And uh, some of it's rehashes, some of it's stories about things I've learned uh, in the production of the Christmas movie. Some of it is just some tricks and tips that we've come uh, come up with and haven't covered yet. And so, yeah, be looking for that stuff middle of December if you're still around. What else? What else? Something else popped to mind. I got nothing. Dead air. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a sure sign that it's time to put this puppy <laughs> to bed. So, anyway, if you're still out there still listening, thank you. Uh, I did notice somebody, I got a, a notification in my email today that somebody had downloaded, like, 22 of the previous podcasts. So, that was cool to see. that Somebody's getting into a chunk of that. I haven't even looked at the metrics. I used to be obsessive about 
seeing how many hits we were getting. And things were actually, I mean, we were having a couple of months where we, a couple of months in a row were right around 2,500 views a month, which is mind boggling yeah. to me. Oh, we don't even know that many people. So it can't be all. It can't be all our moms. I I was just going to say, my mom was on the computer for the first time in almost a year and a half, and she (laughs) called me because she couldn't figure out how to turn the damn thing on. Is that why she never responds to my emails? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, uh, Train of thought keeps dripping in and out. Oh, um, we're we're wrapping up the show. (laughs) We were. Wait, there's a show? (laughs) Crud. Thought this was just my usual Saturday night hanging out at Anthony's house while I don't go home to my family. So we're gonna we're just, we're just hang up some choir mics in the ceiling and just talk and forget. So we can just about lay here and yep. not, yeah, have all the stress and strain of holding an eighty six up to your lips for an hour. <laughs> all right, so yeah, there there will be some stuff coming. Um, in the meantime, I would encourage uh, any of you who are interested, um, if you're not already checking this stuff out. Uh, look up Dave Pensato. The stuff he is putting out is amazing. He's got heavy, heavy hitters coming in every week, pretty much opening up the cookie jar and saying, go ahead, have a rummage in there, and and just Mm -hmm. giving away all the goodies. Uh, The Audio Now cast does not post as frequently, and they are a little more geared towards like film, post, soundtrack work, video game work. Um, But they also have some heavy-duty songwriters on there, uh, some heavy-duty players in the industry, a couple of the regular panel members will uh, occasionally be absent to, you know, pop off and do things like mix the new Metallica record, mix the new U2 record. Um, So those guys over at the Audio Now cast, serious heavy hitters. (laughs) I like how you named two bands that I wish weren't still putting out albums. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And uh, Gear Sluts, if you're looking for more stuff to read, the forums over there are incredibly deep. There's just a ton of stuff on there. Um, What else? What else? Uh, Reddit is actually developing quite a few nice little smaller communities. Um, although, like the audio engineering one, uh, reddit.com slash r slash audio engineering, uh, about 10,000 readers in that group, uh, probably quite a few more lurkers than that. Uh, but the article's coming up. It, it, it's a very friendly environment. Like There are people who post links to some pretty deep topics, but uh, a lot of noobs will just show up. It's very open and welcome. You can post your questions about your home studio, about what you're working on at school, projects and stuff, Mm -hmm. and people who know stuff will politely answer your questions, steer you in the right direction, so that's nice. I've been Mm -hmm. posting over there quite a bit. They also have a live sound forum, which is somewhat smaller, only about 1,000 members in there, Uh, but I'm one of the mods in that group. Um, Again, it's another completely troll-free zone. Uh, A lot of heated arguments get started in there, but they always keep it nice. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. So, uh, yeah, I've seen people get into just wicked hot discussions about <laughs> methods and practices and stuff, and but yet have it, you know, stay away from your mother jokes and all that stuff. Mostly, uh. <laughs> uh, all I can imagine is is you and some some weirdo arguing about Oxfed sub and high pass filter in, in real life. It just Don't turns call out to Gordon. A weirdo. I was, just, I was just gonna say it turns out to be Gordon. <laughs> Gordon got on Reddit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, his Gordon's handle on Reddit is Organ Grinder, nineteen seventy seven. Just kidding. If, the, if I just didn't out somebody else. Uh, so anyway, Reddit Reddit has a couple cool communities. They have an audio post community that's even smaller than that. Um, also, if you're making music, um, I'm running into a lot of people who are making music. Who, you know, who are musicians who are trying to get a hold of gear and do stuff on their own. And uh, they're turning up a lot. So if you're one of those people who's making your own music, um, there are a couple. There's more than one spot to post your stuff up and have people give critiques of it, and that's all good too. All right, wow, we made it across the hour mark. Yeah, and it's not even close to midnight. This is awesome. We we can get in like two or three frames of uh, wee bowling before we turn into no, broomsticks. No, um, Amanda's watching Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, Yeah, that's. Yep. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Well, I guess we're going to sleep early then. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, thanks, folks, for bearing with us. Uh, I have have peeked in at the, the blog a little bit and see that people are still rolling in, checking on us. Hopefully some of those hits are people going back through and checking out some of the back catalog. Uh, please do get in touch and let us know if there's anything we're missing, if there's anything we got wrong, if there's anything you want us to further elaborate on, uh, topics that we haven't touched on yet, stuff that you'd like advice on. We're happy to oblige you in those respects. And so for now, uh, we're about to call this another episode. This has been the 
smart to know his radio. You almost called it, called it the audio nowcast. I did. Yeah, I've <laughs> only listened to 125 <laughs> episodes of that. <laughs> uh, at least I stopped talking like Mike Rodriguez. <laughs> On the yeah, mic. Genius. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. I don't know if you. I doubt he listens. He's probably a pretty busy guy. But actually, I, I sent him an email letting him know that you know he was kind of the inspiration for us to start doing this. And it took a little while, but he sent me a message back, invited me if I'm ever out in the LA area to sit in on a podcast. So that'd be. St-